All right, guys, thank you so much for coming back and tuning in. I have a really special guest with me here today. He has an amazing story. Dr. Nick Norwitz, thank you so much for being here and chatting with me today. Thank you for having me on, Sarah. I'm excited to chat. Yeah. So if you wouldn't mind just telling my audience a little bit about your background and what you do. Yeah. So just a bit on my credentials, academic background, then I'll, I'll give a little bit of my story, which I think is more relevant. Um, I just finished my PhD at, at the University of Oxford in ketogenics and neurodegenerative disease. So I'm really interested in like Alzheimer's disease, brain degeneration, Parkinson's, stuff like that. Um, prior to that, I was at Dartmouth cell, studying uh, cell biology and biochemistry. And um, now I'm in this little break between my PhD and starting at Harvard Medical School. So my objective is to become a physician scientist, MD, PhD, and, and um, next step is, is med school. But um, rewinding back a little further and, and, and what I kind of claim is my, I think, most important credential beyond research, writing, or anything is uh, my experience as a patient, because that's really shaped my perspective on healthcare. And uh, my journey um, as a patient started around age, um, well, I was almost 18. So or about 18. Um, I was a super healthy kid by all outward measures, like never struggled with weight, was really athletic, um, ate a pretty standard healthy American diet, as in like food pyramid style diet with treats, but I never had a weight problem. So didn't think it was an issue. Played soccer, did karate, basketball, um, did a lot of running and started getting quite competitive with my athletics towards the end of high school, um, setting a couple state records for things like push-ups of all things, and then got into half marathons and marathons and um, um, was getting quite excited about that in my athletic future around age 18 when I was the, um, actually I was 17 when I was the youngest qualifier for the 2014 Boston Marathon, oh, which wow. was a huge deal for me because that was, I'm not a spectator sports person, but that was like the event that I always idealized. I grew up right at the base of Heartbreak Hill, which might be the most famous hill in running around mile 17 of the Boston Marathon. And I've been watching it since I was five, dreaming of running it. And um, you can't actually run a major marathon until you're 18. And the 2014 uh -huh. marathon was extra strict because it was the year after the terrorist bombings, mm -hmm. which further amplified the value of this event for me. So I, um, I was 17 when I, uh, I qualified. I think I ran, I was like doing sub three hour marathons at 17. It was, wow. You know, I really enjoyed running. I thought it would be something I do for the rest of my life. I got up on Sundays, went and ran 20 miles. Like I, I, by all outward accounts, I was healthy. And then things started to go downhill. I started to develop weird fractures and not just typical stress fractures that you get with running. Like I just said, I was 17 running 20 miles. You think in a day, um, you wouldn't be surprised if it got a stress, stress fracture. So I wasn't surprised when six weeks before that race, I got a pretty bad fracture in my tibia. But then the thing was, it wasn't healing. And I started getting more and more fractures all over my body, like femur, hip, even in the spine a little bit. And it took a couple of years to actually get a diagnosis of severe osteoporosis, wow. which wasn't congenital. I didn't have it from birth, presumably, because I mean, there was a year where I could run 3000 miles without a problem. So it, it developed um, in conjunction with my lifestyle. We can dig into what that looked like in a little bit. But that was my first strike, my first diagnosis. That was just bizarre for me you can call it my first metabolic disease. I ended up being, I was 20 when I was diagnosed at 20 year olds who had no family history of bone problems. I was a, you know, healthy BMI, normal metabolic, mar normal, you know, all metabolic markers, hormones, testosterone, X, Y, Z. And I had osteoporosis, like T and Z scores, negative 3.3 for people who are medically inclined, Like this was legitimate. This is not hyperbolic. So that was really hard for me as a, a young person who thought I was going to run the rest of my life. I was like, wait, I might never run again. I thought I was going to run for the next like 90 years and drop dead while at the finish line of a marathon or something. That was tough. And, um, and if that was all, I, I, uh, well, I wish that was going to be all. I thought that was going to be all. I thought it was a one-off. I was just a weird zebra and, and that was that. But then I started to develop other issues. Um, again, in association with maybe not the best lifestyle in retrospect, particularly with respect to my diet. Um, I won't go down the rabbit hole of my, say, treatment for osteoporosis, but it did involve 
being prescribed just to eat more calories. I was normal BMI, but like I was then just like pounding down tons and tons of carbs, um, whole foods and processed carbs all alike. Anyway, um, around age 21, I got my second strike, which was um, ulcerative colitis, which is an inflammatory bowel disease. I used to just, you know, and I am a foodie who just, I love to cook. I was the person who like cooked all the dinners at my house, even in high school. Mm. I would eat anything, like literally anything. I had no food aversions, except I didn't really like the texture of cotton candy, but like anything else. <laughs> That's like, so funny. My husband just was talking about how much he hated the texture of cotton candy last night. And I haven't heard anyone say that in forever, but sorry for yeah. interrupting. <laughs> no, no, no. Like it's, I have to put in that caveat because it's just a funny, like when I said, yeah. like, I would eat anything like weird desserts, but also like duck's tongue, any organ, whatever. I love to travel wow. and just any spice, any food, there was no food that I'd say no to trying, including cotton candy. I mean, I had no food aversions and I just love to experience food. So then to develop a disease like ulcerative colitis where everything I ate hurt, compounded on the fact that I had already lost my, you know, kind of athletic career from the osteoporosis, that was kind of, that was really hard for me because now I'd lost another thing that I'd love. Plus all the social complications of colitis. I mean, inflammatory bowel disease, having bloody diarrhea, it's a pretty embarrassing thing, mm. potentially. And so now I was trying to like, I'd lost the love of food. I was trying to navigate food. I was also trying to navigate social situations um, or even just everyday life became really difficult. Like, um, you know, if, if you imagine a, an exam day, like final exam period. Now I've never had trouble taking tests. I've always been gifted as a good test taker. So I never got anxious about walking into tests and say, choosing an answer for a multiple choice, but I would be very anxious. I cover it up, but I was anxious because, you know, I go into the room. What if mid test, I have like a gurgle in my stomach and I have to run out because I'm having a flare or, um, at graduation, I had a, I was giving a speech in front of 11,000 people. Like I was absolutely terrified that I would have an event recorded on camera in front of 11,000 people. Nobody knew what was going on at the time. And I think a lot of people with gut issues are really good about covering it up. And I think I was. Yeah, I, I heard really you know. say on a podcast, I think that you, the day before your graduation, didn't you do like a really long fast and you were, you yeah. kind of did all this prep work just so you wouldn't have an episode during, was that right? Yeah. So, um, I, at this point I wasn't accustomed to fasting or thought it was a good idea. I was eating like six and seven times a day as per my, my, uh, Doctor. Not medical yeah. prescription, but you know, standard advice and advice for, for my particular issues. But uh, yeah, I, I didn't eat the entire day before and um, self-administered a coffee enema. Oh. And not like you order an enema online with proper coffee and you have a thing. It's like I did it with coffee from the dining hall because I was just so clueless and terrified that I'd have a flare. And um, thankfully, everything went all right. In fact, the video is on YouTube. You can see if you can like notice if I, I show any signs. But it was one of the most anxiety-provoking days of my life. And so internally, I was just, I was suffering. I was suffering every day, even if I tried to cover it up and project optimism, because on the outside, I, I really looked like the picture of, I guess, privilege and um, future promise. I, I graduated in Ivy League School Valedictorian and was going to Oxford, then to Harvard from a PD, PhD in MD. And like, you, you think I'd be a very happy person. I was absolutely miserable. And it got worse when I went to Oxford because that's when things, pun intended, shit really hit the fan, mm. where my uh, inflammatory symptoms got extremely bad and I started dropping weight like I, you know, just, just couldn't help it and ended up actually hospitalized for several days with scary low heart rate, a scary low heart rate. Um, for reference, bradycardia, low heart rate is anything below 60 beats per minute. Medically oh. speaking, mine was in the 20s. I was um, admitted at 2 a.m. in late October to an NHS hospital for stomach pain. And it was incidentally noted my heart rate was 28. And then I was kept there for three days, given a bunch of tests and then dismissed without any decent answer. And so that was kind of the straw that broke my back. I'm sitting in my dorm room, just prone, actually on my 23rd birthday. I remember it very vividly, thinking like my future is, is nil. Either I'm going to suffer for the rest of my life, I'm going to die or like, or, or what? It was, it was really kind of sad because I felt very lost. I felt like I, I'm, I'm a 23-year-old I'm a kid, really, 
Mm -hmm. um, in these environments of the smartest physicians on the planet. And I stand by that, like the people at Harvard, people at Oxford, if anybody's going to be, anybody's going to figure out my problems, it's them. Mm -hmm. And I haven't gotten a good answer for any of my conditions. The osteoporosis was a complete question mark. That was weird. The colitis, we kind of have hand wavy things for what it's about, microbiome, dysbiosis, mm -hmm. autoimmune disease, X, Y, Z, but no real good explanation. And then the bradycardia was another giant question mark. Um, that was, that was a, well, that was the only time I actually felt like I'd been given some degree of medical malpractice. The, the fact that they discharged me with the heart rate in the twenties and the explanations they gave about, uh, their, well, I won't go into that, but Hadn't they um, put you in a uh, palliative care also, right? Yeah. I don't know if I would, I don't think I was actually dying, but it's just, that's the limitations of the medical system there. It's a mm. public health system and they didn't have anywhere to put me. So they're like, okay, we're going to put you in the death ward. Oof. with all the people who were demented and dying and people there were literally dying around me. It was the first time I was exposed to death. So it was, uh, it amplified the intensity of the experience. And maybe it was a good thing after all, because it, it, it was pretty hard not to go back after that and think like, Oh, wow. Like something needs to change. Yeah. And so that was the point when I started to make, I say this and I don't mean this I probably should have a better way of articulating this, but I made health my priority. Mm. That's an easy thing to say. It's a harder thing to do Yeah, because everybody's busy in their lives and wants to like, I wanted to focus on my PhD and research. I don't want to have to like dwell on being sick and, and make health the number one thing above. I don't want to have to put the, aside my studies and like, what's going on with me? Let's try to figure it out. In part, because I had no hope, uh, no expectation, at least that I would be able to solve it. But that seemed to me like really my only option. And so I started just to spend a lot of time thinking about what I could try to improve my own health, going to the alternative practices that I had available to me. Again, no expectation, not really any hope, but also nothing to lose. It was a nothing to lose kind of um, attitude. Why not? And so I tried a bunch of different things, um, you know, including various exercises, supplements, probiotic, meditation, yoga, blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, lots of different diets. Mm -hmm. Pretty much any diet you can imagine, I have tried at one point or another for at least a period of three weeks, you name it, I've tried it. And one of the last things on that list of diets to try was a ketogenic diet. Um, not because I was per se fat phobic, but because of what you hear in yeah. media about ketogenic diets, it's like the archetypal fad diet. Yeah. And I, I didn't really understand it. And I had a, this visceral reaction to a high fat diet because not because I was worried about gaining weight. If anything, I wanted that. Um, but because of um, not an intellectual response, but this gut visceral response to the, the concept of a low carb, high fat diet. Mm -hmm. It just, it, it emotionally pushed me the wrong way. Not even, not even cognitively. And I want to make that point clear because even after I had read a lot about it and conceptually it made sense. And I think this is the same for a lot of people, even when you can have that intellectual conversation with them and like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. It's sometimes really hard to overcome the messaging that we've internalized yes. just yeah. from constant exposure to these, these concepts. And I think even people that adopt ketogenic diets, once they kind of really love the lifestyle, they still have a little bit of like, oh, I don't want to have too many egg yolks or I don't want to have too much fat. There is still some of that yep. um, just because Definitely. the message is so prevalent. But anyway, like I said, I had nothing to lose. So I tried it. And for me, it was like a switch. Like within, that was a bad snap. <laughs> within about a week, um, I was feeling so much better, like better than I had felt in months. I really felt alive again. My stomach pains were, my, at least my colitis pains and the bloody diarrhea was gone. I uh, had tons of energy, like a weird amount of energy, especially for how much I had like emaciated over the past few weeks. And I was, I was just happy, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is really cool for me. I didn't understand what was going on, but at that point, I didn't really care. At that point also, and, and this is also an important thing, I thought, I was again, a medical zebra. So you hear about like, just to explain what that term means, they say, um, uh, you know, when you hear hoofbeats, think horse, not zebra, zebra being the weird medical case, the kind of like esoteric, mm. bizarre one. 
I just kept on thinking through all of this. I was just a weird, weird case. Osteoporosis, ulcerative colitis, low heart rate. Like, what is this? Nobody has these constellations of symptoms. So I thought I was unique. And I also thought my response to this diet was unique. I didn't care. It seemed to be working. Mm. But um, it was only a little while later that I really had my epiphany, which wasn't about me so much as about the generalizability of um, my story arc, Mm. which is not exactly osteoporosis, blah, 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 um, colitis, bradycardia, but the motif of patient struggles with a metabolic disease, patient struggles in a conventional healthcare system and isn't improving as desired and becomes desperate. Mm. Patient tries something different, specifically a clean, low carb diet, and a patient has remarkable results with whatever their metabolic disease is, because I think these are all interlinked, be it my colitis, be it somebody else's prediabetes, be it somebody else's cardiovascular disease. These are all part of what I call like the metabolic disease tree. So if you can imagine a tree with a, a trunk that has core metabolic pathologies and all the branches are kind of different individual diseases, we all have different predispositions to go down a different branch it's called diathesis or predispositions and manifest differently. And I manifested in a kind of a unique way. But again, there is this motif that now I see all around me of person struggles with a metabolic disease, isn't having the results they want. And then they try a metabolic health approach, mm-hmm. including a low carbohydrate diet or intermittent fasting. And the results are remarkable and they get really excited about it. And there are literally thousands, if not tens of thousands of people who have experienced this. Um, And it's been over the past couple of years that I've really been delving into both the research, performing my own and and, um, just reading the literature and getting to know the the metabolic health community and realizing what a powerful tool. I'm just going to say metabolic medicine, even beyond ketogenic diets or low-carb diets, is broadly in why... It's really what we need for the future of medicine because the diseases we're struggling with now, diabetes, Alzheimer's, obesity, metabolic syndrome, we're not going to treat them with a pill. No. Um, Not effectively. We need metabolic medicine for metabolic diseases. And I see this enormous opportunity because, and this is going to sound, well, I don't know. And I also know that my perspective is always going to change, but for for me going into medical school is like a young person looking around me and seeing this healthcare crisis to understand, or to at least be of the opinion right now that, oh, it's not that we don't have an answer or a solution. We actually kind of do. We just haven't haven't implemented it. Mm -hmm. And so, so to, 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 to be in a position where, you, you know, you can kind of start for that implementation. Uh, especially with, um, with, among your, your peers, potentially, that's kind of my hope. That's, that's pretty exciting for me. And so right now I just, I, I'd love to spend my time reading papers, engaging with people in the community, talking with my peers, talking with professors. It's, um, just a, a pleasure to be able to explore this space in every capacity that I can. So that was a lot. I'm going to shut up for a moment and let you speak, <laughs> but that's my story in a nutshell. Um, yeah. There's a more dramatized version with music on YouTube if you're interested. It's like I loved it. I watched that yesterday. It was great. But, um, <laughs> it was really. Yeah, and I'll link it in the show notes. My purpose. Thanks. Um, yeah. A, a friend helped me put it together, which is it's it's more articulate than I could do on my own. Maybe sound really good, but um, yeah. Now, now I just whatever. So um, I'm happy to take this conversation in whatever direction you want to take it. Be it breaking down scientific studies, being talking meta- broadly about metabolic health, whatever. Yeah. Uh, You know, one thing I wanted to back up and talk about is after you had that week on the ketogenic diet, I remember you had said that you had gotten, I guess it was a stool sample done before that. And then you had another, you asked your doctor and he was like, man, let's, it's only been a week. You don't really need to test, but there was a dramatic difference in those two tests. Can we talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, sure. So for ulcerative colitis, the standard marker is a, a stool marker of inflammation called calprotectin, fecal calprotectin. And uh, my levels have kind of always run high. Um, the upper threshold of normal is about 50. I'm actually blinking on the units, but let's just say 50 because I know that's, that's the threshold. <laughs> I was running at like 150 uh, on medications. So three times the threshold of normal. After a week in the ketogenic diet, my uh, marker went down to, a, 
it was around 20. So it dropped about eightfold, seven, eightfold, um, which was, you know, the first time it, well, not the first time it'd been in normal range, but the first time it was actually persistently in the normal range for a long time. And, um, and then after that, I just kind of progressively titrated off my medications. Um, I've been on several for, for colitis that after I came off all of them, the inflation just completely stayed away. Mm. Just, it did not come back. And I've never, ever had an issue with colitis. Now my gut isn't perfect, but I haven't had an issue with colitis since adopting a ketogenic diet since that week. Wow. It has not bothered me. That's amazing. Um, so yeah, I, um, I, I couldn't be more grateful for that. And my bones are also, um, I, I'm no longer osteoporotic, which is pretty amazing because that's not the kind of thing that really reverses without aggressive therapy, which admittedly I am on. I think there's a place for Western medicine. In fact, I spent a summer at MGH studying bone therapy and one of the most went on the most aggressive treatments you can. But weirdly, after I adopted um, a ketogenic diet, there was a worry, and this was my biggest concern, that my bones would suffer even if everything else got better because mm. of just, you know, conventional theory about carbohydrates and bone health. Weirdly, re- my, my um, certain regions continued to improve as they had on the drug. So like my spine, which is mostly spongy bone called trabecular bone, but other regions like my hip and my femur, which are more cortical bone. So there's the spongy bone and then there's the like hard shell on the outside. Regions that were, were more enriched in that hard shell, they actually didn't improve even on the most aggressive drugs. But once I went on the ketogenic diet, a ketogenic diet, my, um, they improved as well, which was interesting. Wow. So I can't say that a ketogenic diet made my bones stronger, but it definitely didn't hurt. And that in and of itself is interesting, especially because I couldn't help but losing a little bit of weight on yeah. the diet, um, no matter how much I was eating, to be perfectly honest. Wow. Yeah. And when you were doing the ketogenic diet, were you doing like specific to be in ketosis or were you just limiting carbs? Like, were you doing super like high fat and kind of yeah. moderated protein? Um, how were you actually doing it? Just curious. Yeah, I was in ketosis. Um, I think, you know, on average, it, dif- it changes as I change the composition of my ketogenic diet, but morning fasting ketones were always above one millimole. Oh, good. Okay. Um, there were parts of my diet when I was, you know, above like three millimoles in the morning. So it was, yeah. it was ketogenic. I've, you know, done various forms of ketogenic diet from Mediterranean keto to carnivore and kind of whatever in between. Um, but yeah, no, it is a bonafide ketogenic diet. And, um, for me, that means it varies, but on the order of 300 grams of fat per day between 20 to 30 net carbs and around a hundred and 10, 115 grams of protein. So around like a 70, 80, 78, 80% fat diet. Yeah. Um, it's ketogenic. That doesn't mean everybody has to do that, but that's where I feel quite well. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think everyone needs to do that, but I no, feel definitely. like for a lot of people that are really suffering with metabolic issues, yeah. metabolic health, they need to do that because it's kind of trendy right now to say you're doing keto, but they are just limiting carbs. Yeah. And the fat's not high enough. And so they're not truly in ketosis. And I'm like, there's benefits to that, I think. But to to truly, I feel like get healing for the brain and for the metabolism, it's got to be in ketosis. It depends. Yeah, it really depends on what your condition is. Yes. Um, I mean, if you're just trying, if you're, I shouldn't say just, but if you're trying to lose weight Mm -hmm. or, you know, reverse prediabetes or diabetes, it's really about reducing your insulin mostly. Mm-hmm. Now there are benefits of ketones on top of that, presumably, and I can talk about some of the mechanisms there, some of which is unpublished data, but, um, as of this time it's submitted, Yeah. but for the most part, it's getting your insulin down. And so if you're doing 50 grams of carbs a day, eating a whole foods diet, and you're trying to, you know, lose weight, are you really going to benefit by cutting those extra, you know, 30 grams of carbs to get into ketosis? Maybe not. And I wouldn't push somebody to do that. It's whatever works in their lifestyle. Now, if you're someone suffering from, you know, uh, a neurological disease Mm -hmm. or um, honestly, uh, you know, for for me, like inflammatory bowel disease, I do think, and there are, you know, biologically plausible reasons to believe being in ketosis, having ketones circulating in your system while having your insulin low would be um, therapeutic on top of uh, carbohydrate restriction. So ketogenic diets are a subset of therapeutic carbohydrate reduction. And I think you have to take that on a case by case basis. 
we can talk about the different diseases that would benefit from different strategies, but I would say generally for autoimmune and neurological conditions, being in ketosis probably does have additional benefit, but most people go on ketogenic diets for weight loss. Yep. Uh, in which case therapeutic carbohydrate reduction without ketosis is totally sufficient. I agree. I totally agree. And what are some of those unpublished studies that you're referring to about the ketones? I'm super curious about that. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm actually, I, I'm, I'm thinking about some of them on which I am not first author. So I don't want to give away data that the first author might not be happy with, but I will um, allude to the fact that there are, I'll, I'll just say generally, ketone bodies, and we can talk about this beyond, um, say, weight loss, ketone bodies are not just energy metabolites, they are hormones. Mm. They bind to receptors on cell surfaces. They change DNA expression um, and a whole host of things. Um, they even act themselves as what are called PTMs, post-translational modifications on proteins inside cells. So maybe you've heard of like methylation and acetylation. Yes. It was beta hydroxybutyrylation. Um, I think, I think by most recent count, 1,397 different proteins are uniquely modified by beta hydroxybutyrate. It really reprograms and reshapes your metabolism, wow. including how your say liver runs. Um, and that can have additional therapeutic benefits. Um, it's also been shown that, and this isn't by any means proof, but the author that published this also is the one that's going to publish some of the mechanism data that exogenous ketones can have a little benefit um, added to a standard diet for glycemic control by a bunch of different measures. Um, average uh, blood glucose on a CGM, time in range, HbA1c, fructosamine. Now the effects are minor and I definitely promote actual therapeutic carbohydrate reduction. But that combined with um, some mechanisms that maybe I can come back and talk about once, once the paper is, uh, at least accepted Yeah, that, um, I do think there might be, might be additional benefits. Um, but I would say 90% and that's a number I'm just making up, uh, about 90% <laughs> of the benefit for weight loss and reversal of diabetes would come from therapeutic carbohydrate reduction. Um, and then there are a lot of unknowns about various forms of ketogenic diets, like their effect long-term on the microbiome yes, or brain health. Um, and so these are all, all things that I think are very interesting. One of the things I love about this space is how much unknowns there are yes, um, and how much you can kind of make the argument either way. But I guess that's kind of the art of medicine, figuring out, you know, in your pro and cons list for each individual, how to weigh those factors. Because for yeah. one person, it might be different than another. Absolutely. And that's something I've definitely been diving into on my channel and on my podcast is talking to a uh, microbiologist, just trying to, my whole thing is like, I want to kind of get out of the echo chamber a little bit. So I've even had people on my show that I, and this is obviously not one of those conversations, but I disagree with some of the yeah. stuff that they say, because they work with a lot of patients and they have a lot of experience. So I always like to hear okay, well, what do you think about how this is going to wreck the microbiome or like, you know, it's interesting to hear those theories as well. I uh, agree a hundred percent. I think that doubt is, I tweeted this the other day, I think doubt is a scientist's most valuable tool. You need to talk to people with differing opinions, provided you respect each other. Yeah. Um, so I, I totally encourage that practice. Have you, speaking about the microbiome, um, I'll put a plug in for a great blog associated with a peer reviewed article I read recently. Um, by Lucy Mailing. I've been trying to get a hold of her. <laughs> She's so hard to get a hold of. I want to have her on my podcast. <laughs> her, her blog on uh, is a ketogenic diet bad for gut health is yeah. the best like accessible layperson thing I've read on that topic. So since we probably won't go down the rabbit hole, if, you know, people were kind of teased by that topic. Look, go to lucymailing.com and check out that blog. I read it recently and it was really well mm -hmm. put and it's associated with a peer reviewed study. Um, or at least review study, a narrative review. And I thought it made some really compelling arguments, um, kind of playing devil's advocate both ways and giving a little bit of, uh, you know, if you have this problem, then this might be better for you or X, Y, Z caveats. It was well thought out. So anyway, check yeah. it out. Yeah, I think it's fascinating to explore those things. And yeah. kind of going back to 
I guess the whole idea of metabolic health, it's such a broad term. I mean, and yeah. a lot of my audience, a lot of women, a lot of them have PCOS. A lot of them have um, hormonal issues. I have a lot of women who are postmenopausal who are suffering really badly as well with those hormonal issues. And I think people are so quick to just say, let's go on HRT or let's like, you know, give you metformin, let's do this. And a lot of these people are like, I'm looking at these diets as a way to kind of help with these things and yeah. having a lot of great success. And so can we talk about, I guess, just how, what you've seen with mm -hmm. metabolic health and ketogenic diet? For sure. First, I'm, I'm going to claim cowardice because, um, with respect to the topic of women's health, I yeah. always am afraid as someone with a Y chromosome of just co appearing completely ignorant or without credibility. So <laughs> we can touch on that, but, um, I'm a, a 25 year old male, so I don't want to speak to authority to women's issues, especially postmenopausal. I have some thoughts based on papers, but that is definitely not an experience I have had. That said, yeah, let's define metabolic health. Um, now I will say this is a hard thing to properly define. In fact, I'm part of groups, including the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners that's still struggling to really well define it. Mm -hmm. But let, let's just first define metabolic syndrome because that's kind of maybe an easy place to start the story. And so Metabolic syndrome is um, defined by a constellation of symptoms. If you have any three of the following five, you have metabolic syndrome. That is high blood pressure or hypertension, um, high uh, insulin or fasting blood glucose, a large waist circumference, high triglycerides or like fat molecules in the mm -hmm. blood, and low HDL cholesterol. So those are kind of the five. If you have any three of those five, you have metabolic syndrome. And right now about a third of Americans have metabolic syndrome. And you hear this paper quoted all the time, but about 88% of yep. Americans have at least one of the risk factors. So they're on the spectrum of being metabolically unhealthy, which means 12% of people are actually metabolically healthy. They don't have any of those factors, which is a concerning number. Yeah. Um, so that's what metabolic syndrome is. Now, why is it important? Well, metabolic syndrome is kind of a, a, a red herring canary in the coal mine for basically any other chronic metabolic disease you can think of, be that obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, whatever, you name it, a problem that's like a, a metabolic health problem, it's going to be associated with metabolic syndrome. And that's because metabolic syndrome indicates that you have some underlying really common pathologies. Going back to that tree of metabolic health or metabolic disease I was talking about, you know, the trunk is um, made up of things like oxidative stress, inflammation, insulin resistance, and these things are mutually in reinforcing. So when you have metabolic syndrome, you have this, these underlying pathologies of inflammation and insulin resistance, oxidative stress that are feeding off of each other. Um, and you can help quell them by say, reversing the metabolic syndrome. And we can talk about how to do that in a minute. Um, because there are control trials showing that we can ind indeed do that effectively. But um, just building on this analogy, because I, I, I often go to it of the metabolic tree, if the branches of the indiv individual diseases with their individual symptoms, the leaves, they all look a little bit different. The trunks, the pathologies of metabolic syndrome or metabolic disease, inflammation, oxidative stress, uh, insulin resistance, then the roots, what feeds the tree of metabolic disease, those are lifestyle factors. Mm -hmm poor sleep, lack of exercise or activity. And I think the biggest root of all is nutrition, proper human nutrition. Um, and so that's how I like to kind of conceptualize it easily through that analogy of the metabolic tree. Now, what else is metabolic? There's a lot of ways I've, I've defined metabolic health differently on different podcasts. You just define what metabolic syndrome is, what you know these metabolic markers are. So you could say metabolic health can be measured by particular markers, having like a low fasting insulin or very little um, pathological insulin resistance, um, having low visceral fat, having uh, probably a, a higher HDL to triglyceride ratio, um, stuff like that. But I think there are also more subjective markers of metabolic health. Like, do you get up in the morning and feel energized? Mm -hmm. Can you go a long period of time without food and just, you know, be happy and energized and not get that, like, you know, I haven't eaten in four hours slump. Mm -hmm. um, 
And do you have the like, you know, uh, muscle mass and, and energy to just be an active, happy person and go about your life doing the things you want to do, be that playing with your grandchildren, that being that, uh, you know, just rock climbing, hiking, whatever. I feel like that's a component of metabolic health. And then I think I said this on the diet doctor podcast, I think there's actually a psychological component. Yes. Which, um, is, is a mindset with respect to how do you approach health? When I think of someone with optimal metabolic health, I envision someone who thinks about nutrition and health as not a static thing, but as a journey, as an opportunity, not as a chore, like, oh, I have to eat healthy, but like, wow, I get to control my metabolism and my body through what I do day in and day out from what I put in my body. And I can make aging and health not a decline, but an ascension, always kind of moving asymptotically to my best self. Um, and, and part of that for some people, not everybody, but is, is tracking the markers. So you can like track and improve and, and get into the data. Not everybody has to do that. I love to do that. Yeah, Maybe me you're too. someone who likes to do that too. I oh, love yeah. to see like, if I change these fat ratios, what happens to these particles in my blood, X, Y, Z? I find it very interesting. And I think having that mindset to an extent is a component of metabolic health. You don't actually have to measure, but just being observant of being like, when I eat this, I feel this. Mm -hmm. Because if we're going to incorporate feeling of some sort into the definition of metabolic health, those subjective measures, then I also think how you relate to those is a component of metabolic health. And so when I imagine the optimally metabolically healthy person, I imagine someone with no markers of metabolic syndrome, someone who has the energy to do what they want. Um, and uh, someone who is kind of excited about using nutrition and metabolic medicine to improve themselves, uh, as a person. Mm. So that's a very broad definition, but that's what I think of when I think of metabolic health, you have anything to add to that? No, I love it. I love it. And I love testing. I love metrics and just kind of seeing how my body responds to different yeah. things and sharing that. That's kind of like what my whole platform and channel has been about for the last two and a half years of like, yeah. And I think it's important that we do that. I mean, there's people who can definitely stress out about things too much that are not that important, yeah. but I think it's important to check in on those things for sure. Yeah. Well, it's like a scientific process. Yes. You you have the data to generate hypotheses that you can then play around with. Mm -hmm. Or some people, it's even just the science enthuses them. Like, this is really cool. My friend, we, I was just on a podcast with my friend, uh, Dr. Adrian Soto. He's a MD, PhD do down over in Mexico. And we are probably the two nerdiest people you can imagine. <laughs> like, we did our PhDs over in Oxford and we would just like spend hours over dinner just talking about the most recent whatever research. It wasn't even our PhDs. We'd go read cell for fun and like neuron and science and then talk about the papers. But we were talking about how, you know, the more you learn about how metabolism works, the more quote expert you become, the more you realize you'll never be able to figure this out. No human <laughs> will. And that actually tracking all the metrics, like tracking some metrics is useful at a point, but it, it, it kind of becomes a little bit um, of a focusing on the trees and missing the forest kind of thing. Yeah. So in the end, what really matters is the feeling. Nevertheless, I still love to read a paper about how bile acids that we think digest fat actually work in the brain to alter insulin sensitivity and then theorize about how, or hypothesize about how what I eat might change that mechanism and then go on. And that inspires me to play with my nutrition. Now, not everybody has to be that way about it, but, um, again, it's about the mindset, about finding a way to let, let, let food be not only a gustatory pleasure, but also an experimental one, because I think, and maybe this is naive to say, but I think all humans are scientists by nature. We're yeah. all curious and that kind of gets beaten out of us, even non-sciencey people. That's how we go through life. Yeah. And maybe that's even what life is about, like going through the world and adapting your model of what the world is and how you relate to it. And then yeah. you just want to, you know, get to the best model you can before you die. I, I don't have a better like purpose of life for me. That's kind of what I enjoy doing. <laughs> it sounds like fun. I mean, that's, and it's, it's interesting too. And just going back to the whole topic of metabolic health, how, what would you say to somebody who says, I've got 
obviously I have metabolic disease from, I've hit at least three of those five criteria reversing metabolic disease. Is this possible? Is this something that people can actually do and how do they go about doing that? Yeah. Well, the thing I love about metabolic medicine is it's not dogmatic or it shouldn't be it's endpoint focused, which means whatever you do to get to those endpoints, if we're going to define those endpoints, whatever you do as an individual to get there, like the proof is in the pudding, the proof is in the endpoints. So if we want to, let's say the markers you have are, you have really high triglycerides, you have like a low HDL and you have a lot of visceral fat, a large waist circumference. If you do something and can achieve reversing those three and not have markers of metabolic syndrome, then I really don't care what you did um, if it works. So mm -hmm. I want to, I want to put that in place before I say what I'm going to say, because say you were someone that used a low fat vegan diet to do that. Good on you. Yeah. Um, it's possible. I think it's probably not the most efficient ideal way to do that. So what I'm going to say next is, well, I'll, I'll reference one study that also gets referenced a lot. It was by Hyde, H-Y-D-E et al. in um, uh, the Journal of Clinical Investigations, JCI in 2019. And in this study, what they did is they took people with metabolic syndrome, 16 of them, and they did what's called a randomized crossover study. So not only did they randomize people to three different diets, and I'll describe what those are in a minute, but each person took uh, engaged in every single diet. So everybody was serving as their own control. You were compared, you know, comparing me to me on a different diet, um, which is, you know, a very robust form of scientific uh, study. And each person was on each diet for four weeks with washout periods in between, like any good crossover trial should have. Now, what were the diets? Well, all diets were controlled for calories. On average, I think 2,950 calories. Mm. Um, they were all controlled for protein. They had the same amount of protein. The only thing that differed was if you traded the carbohydrate calories for fat calories. So there was a higher carb diet that was 60% carb and 20% um, fat and then 20% protein. One that was 40% carb, 40% fat and 20% protein, so middle. And then a um, low carb, high fat diet, 20% carb, 60% fat and 20% um, protein. So none of these were actually ketogenic. I wanna point that out. This yeah. is therapeutic carbohydrate reduction. This wasn't ketosis. That said, what were the results? Well, despite having the same number of calories in every arm, same protein, people who are on the um, lower fat diet, out of those 16 people with metabolic syndrome, one person reversed metabolic syndrome on the mm -hmm. lower fat diet. So it worked for one in 16. Um, versus the low carbohydrate diet, out of 16, nine people in four weeks, reverse metabolic syndrome. Wow. And remember, these are people comparing people to themselves. Yes. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a pretty robust control. So there was a, a much stronger effect of a low carb diet for reversing the markers of metabolic syndrome, even when calories were kept consistent, even over a period of just four weeks. Mm. And so you imagine extending this to more than four weeks because there were like trending markers that weren't significantly different, like say like a decrease in liver fat, which would have probably been significant over a longer period of time. And there are other effects of therapeutic carbohydrate reduction on people who are overweight or with metabolic syndrome, like a spontaneous reduction in appetite. So generally people who cut carbs will end up eating a lot less. Mm. Um, and so that can help if somebody is overweight, that can help lose weight and reverse metabolic syndrome. And so even though there were intentional barriers because they want to control for calories in this intervention, it still showed that independent of caloric restriction um, and independent really of weight loss, therapeutic carbohydrate reduction was effective, which lends credence to the notion that this, I think, a therapeutic carbohydrate reduction protocol is something that should be on the table mm. for people with markers of metabolic syndrome. So 88% of the population I think they should go into the doctor's office and the doctor should say, we have this therapeutic carbohydrate restriction protocol. This is an option for you. You don't have to do it, but it's an option. And that's really what I'm passionate about because 
that was never something that was ever presented to me or I think a lot of mm -hmm. other people. It's kind of taboo to bring up. I went to dozens of doctors and nobody even mentioned the ketogenic mm -hmm. diet. Now I wasn't overweight, but it, it just wasn't even on the table. So just to have it incorporated as an option, not as the be all end all, I think there, it can coexist with other options, but having as an option, I think would be as a, a huge, huge step. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I think that's where to start. That's where I have my most experience with respect to the research and coaching people. And I find most people who really give it a true try tend not to want to go back for a whole host of reasons, not just losing weight, but I think probably the most common thing I hear is like, I went on a ketogenic diet to lose weight, but I'm remaining on it because I have so much energy and my brain feels amazing. Yeah. Um, which makes a lot of sense, but usually you, you, you go to TCR, um, therapeutic carbohydrate reduction for one reason. And then you stay on it for a whole host of other reasons that you just, you didn't expect these things would happen, but if you give it a shot, I just think it's worth a try for anybody. I agree. And it's like, there's so many different things that it fixed for me that I wasn't expecting it to, yeah. you know, I was on so many medications for depression, anxiety, and insomnia, like five different medications. And I'd never been able to stay off of them that had been since I was a teenager. And now it's like, I haven't touched any medication in almost five years and I haven't yeah. felt the need to call a doctor and say, can I get a prescription for this? And that's just one of those things. It's like, we're so reliant on the pills and the medications from the doctor. And, uh, I have like, I have, I'm on zero, you know, and yeah. it's, it's like unheard of. I had to go in for procedure back in February and get anesthesia. And they were like, okay, let's talk about your medication list. And I was like, I don't have any. They were yeah. like, what, what? It's like, no, really. <laughs> they were like, we never have this. I'm like, really? <laughs> and it's, it's really fascinating to see the things that get reversed that people say can't be reversed. Like you yeah. mentioned PCOS before. Yep. I've seen, I've known so many people that were like, my doctor says I'll never get pregnant. Yes. They, you know, they go on a, a, a TCR protocol and they get pregnant. Um, I think yep. you might know Dave Feldman. Yeah. He was saying the other day in a clubhouse that the person he knew with the highest insulin resist, the highest insulin, fasting insulin ever was insulin, insulin level of, I think, um, 70 micro units per liter fasting, which is really high. That's very high. Yeah. And the doctor said, you know, she had PCOS, she's never going to get pregnant. She went uh, keto. A little while later, she was pregnant and then ended up delivering twins. Wow. And it, it, it mechanistically it makes sense. So just to delve into the mechanism a little bit of PCOS, because it's interesting, we talk about like insulin resistance. Yep. As a core pathology of a lot of these different diseases, it works differently in, in, in different tissues, but say for for uh, PCOS, what ends up happening is when your body, most of your body is insulin resistant pathologically, your pancreas ends up spitting out more insulin to compensate. So your fasting insulin levels go up, but this person had levels of 70 micro units per liter. Um, but the funny thing about the ovaries is that the fecal cells of the ovaries, um, which have the enzyme aromatase, which converts testosterone to estrogen, they actually, not all cells in the body will become insulin resistant. So in this setting of insulin resistant and other organs, it does not become insulin resistant. Therefore, when insulin levels go up, that really high insulin is over um, uh, signaling to aromatase. And so you have um, a decreased production of estrogen and an increase in androgens. So when you lower the estrogen, that kind of, uh, sorry, the lower the insulin, that kind of reverses. It's very different in different organ systems, but it's really fascinating when you delve into each of these different um, conditions and see just a little bit of the mechanisms by which diet and lifestyle like alter alter everything. I just read another paper, one this morning, on um, uh, the notion of have I ever heard the term trained immunity? No, I haven't. So your body has kind of two branches of the immune system. There's the innate immune system, which is just kind of general nonspecific and then the adaptive, which like shoots out antibodies. And when we think about, you know, you're exposed to an, um, inflam like a, a, I don't know, like a microbe or an infection. We think about the adaptive immune system generating antibodies that when you have that infection, again, you'll be able to mount a better response to it. Mm. But then there's also this concept of trained immunity, which is when your general innate immune system becomes a lot more active upon prior exposure. So you're in a more primed to be inflammatory state in general. 
And one of the things that was recently discovered, I think this is a 2018 paper in Cell, was that there can be what are called sterile, so non-microbe, non-infection triggers to, to stimulate innate uh, immune system memory learning or trained immunity. So to make your immune system really more inflammatory, including a Western diet. So they showed a, in this one paper, they showed a Western diet um, activated what's called the NLRP3 inflammasome, which is actually inhibited by ketones, fun fact, um, to trigger trained immunity. And the cool thing about this was if you, if it, it, part of the effect, it wasn't um, very easy to pick up on standard serum markers of inflammation after you stop a Western diet, or at least after mice stop the Western diet, but there was epigenetic and transcriptomic reprogramming of stem cells mm. in the bone marrow that are mediating this effect. So there was like a reprogramming in stem cells in the bone marrow, which wasn't really apparent on say serum testing. Um, that's just one more example that came to mind because it was a paper I was reading this morning, or there was a new paper, the one I alluded to that uh, me and my friend were talking about the other day about bile acids in the brain. It's like bile acids that digest fat. They get secreted by, you know, your liver. They're made by your liver from cholesterol. We think, oh, their job is to digest fat. Turns out they trigger signaling receptors in the brain, one called TGR5, to alter hunger, energy expenditure, thyroid hormone gene expression, uh, uh, DIY1, I think, like thermogenesis and insulin sensitivity around the body. That's bile acids. Things that digest fat wow. in your gut signal in your brain. And those levels of those bile acids in the brain decrease when you become obese by wow. which, you know, obesity could feed forward to promote more obesity. So I'm not spitting these out because I, I want people to really completely understand what I'm saying. I'm probably not also being perfectly articulate, but just to drill home the point that, and this is something I really didn't appreciate until I tried a ketogenic diet for myself is that this food is medicine stuff. It's not, it's not soft science. No, it's not fruity. And I used to think it was, I was like, food is medicine. Come on. Like, give me, give me the like cool procedures and the CRISPR Cas9 X, Y, Z. Um, and, and now I'm looking at the mechanism. Like this is unbelievable. This is so cool. The yep. power we have, uh, to transform our bodies and our metabolisms with the quality of the food we eat and even things like food meal timing yes. has an unbelievable effect um, metabolism. There was this one study showing that like, um, you know, jet lag or, you know, disturbed, uh, you know, timing of eating can alter your metabolism and, um, you know, metabolic markers and obesity, quite frankly. So they could take like microbiomes from jet lag people when they were jet lag versus when they were not transplant them into not abiotic or germ-free mice. And if you gave a jet lag microbiome to a germ-free mouse, so a mouse without its own microbiome, it became obese. Wow. versus a normal microbiome. So all these really weird things like biogeography, biogeography changes in the microbiome that happen over the course of every single day. It's, I just get enthused about it. You can tell because it's just so cool at every level and everything connects to everything else. And that all comes back to what you had for lunch. Yeah. And when you had lunch. Exactly. Yeah. People don't really, I feel like there's so much out there now where people are like, oh, ketogenic, diets, that's diet culture. That's one thing I hear that just drives me up the wall is there's like a lot of dietitians and nutritionists out there that are like, it's diet culture. And I'm like, actually it's not diet culture. It's not, it's about reversing health conditions. And there's so many things that we can do that I've talked to at this point, two and a half years in this space, plus like thousands of people who have pretty amazing stories. I'm, I have a patient right now who are not a patient. I'm not a doctor. I have a client right now who is uh, going through chemo and was told this is terminal and just got a report from his doctor. And he's like, I don't know what you've been doing, but keep doing it. I think you might actually beat this. And yeah. he's been doing a high fat carnivore diet. So a ketogenic version of the carnivore diet and fasting around his chemo and the doctor's like, I yeah. really wasn't expecting this, but I think you're going to beat this. And I was yeah, like, the, the oh, cancer wow. stuff, that's fascinating. And I think obviously it, neither you or I are saying ketogenic diets will reverse cancer. Right. Um, just like, I don't think Steve Jobs should have done a vegan diet. To no. Cancer. We know how that ended. Of, that yeah. said, 
the fact that there's a possibility for these people that are otherwise like kind of without hope, like why not try it? Yeah. Come back to like my position. It's like, what do you have to lose? Yeah. Really? And we're transforming the way we think about diseases like cancer every single day. I mean, the, the, the old protocol for cancer for a lot of cancer patients was like, all right, we don't want them to waste away. So just feed them everything you can mm-hmm. and they should rest. And now we have like fasting for cancer patients. Mm-hmm. And um, there was just an article about exercise oncology is now a new field. Why mm-hmm. patients with cancer should actually exercise. Um, so it's, it's transforming. I don't know if you've um, had the chance to look at or hear about or read the book Ravenous by Sam Apple. I have it yesterday. It's, it's a book about the, the cancer diet connection and about sugar. It's fascinating. People should check it out. Um, but, but, um, yeah, no, the punchline is sugar is, is a, a big contributor to, um, cancer and, and even in it, in the final chapters they he points out how the, the landscape is changing very prominent people. Like, um, you might've heard the name, um, Siddhartha Mukherjee. Mm-hmm. Um, who, who wrote um, The Emperor of All Maladies, one of the most famous cancer books. And he's now looking into like the diet cancer connection. Like people are really interested in this stuff because there's biological plausibility to how changes in diet, especially ketogenic diets could change metabolism to enhance chemotherapy yeah. or otherwise help to protect against, um, protect against cancer. Yeah. I mean, cancer cells, most of them really like to feed on sugar. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I just turned 42 last week and my mom, when she was my age was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It was horrible. They didn't think she was going to make it. She's yeah. still here. Thank goodness. But it's like, she was my age when she got diagnosed and for the, she's just been like, Oh, you know, you gotta be careful. She doesn't really believe in the diet stuff. But I'm like, this is one of the reasons why I stay in this lifestyle is because I know that this you know, there could be something in my genetic code that might make me a bit more susceptible to getting cancer at a young age. Yeah. And there's so much information out there that shows that this is a great preventative. So why the heck, if I know something could be a great preventative, then why the heck not do it? You know, the yeah. ice cream and the cake and this, st- it's just not appealing to me because it's yeah. not going to help prevent cancer, you know? Well, 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 that's also a really, really big thing you just touched on. What do you have to give up Right. To adopt these preventative measures. And I think that also comes to a misperception of what TCR and ketogenic diets are, this diet culture you talked about. Yep. Because when I say to someone like, I don't do sweets, the response I generally get from someone I haven't met before is something like, and and in a well-meaning tone, although I, it's something like, oh, like you're so strong. I couldn't live without (laughs) cake. Right. Like, yeah. I love my this, that, or the other. And quite honestly, I, I, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit frustrated, but also pity someone who it's not about, it's not about the pleasure that brings you. It's the fact that, that you're shackled to that craving and that pleasure. I'm not avoiding yeah. sweets because I'm depriving myself. I have no, I have no desire. I never thought I would say that. I used to have a huge sweet tooth. Oh yeah. Um, and I never thought like, I would say, oh, I, I don't have a craving t- taste for sweets, but now I can sit like, you put an ice cream cake in front of me. I was like, nah, like, I don't want it. Like if I, if I feel peckish for dessert, I'm like, I'll honestly just chew on a block of like coconut, frozen coconut butter, or like coconut oil or whatever. Like that's kind of what I have craving for your, your taste preferences change. So it's not about not having sweets. It's about not being shackled to that craving because presumably that's, that's a, a desire that most people, if they had their druthers would dispense with. If you could say Mm -hmm. you could press a button and you could not want cake. Yep. Would you press that button? And I think most people would say yes. Yeah. And I don't think most people understand is you actually have that option by reprogramming your metabolism, your taste to not have, um, that sweet drive and also to kind of adjust your perception of uh food such that now I, I you know i used to eat like you know when i was in college like buckets of cookies and ice cream yep daily and like i thought that was nice i thought i enjoyed it and now it's funny because i know what that felt like i remember what that felt like and now if i just be like i want a, a two like like sweet frozen cherries cherries and certain things don't freeze completely 
and I can eat that on a ketogenic diet, given what I eat and not go out of ketosis. Yeah. Or just like a, a couple like wild blueberries, a little handful. That yeah. is so much more sweet now for me than any of those things ever were because yeah. I've adapted. Um, and so I can get more pleasure out of that and also simple foods than I ever could out of food before. I get more pleasure now out of food than I used to, despite not eating most of the things that most other people find really pleasurable. And I don't think people really appreciate that's possible, nor are they probably going to believe me by listening to me. But if you try it, you really try it. I, I, I think it's possible for everyone, to be quite honest. Yeah. And the thing is, I, I was having this conversation with my husband the other night. It's like, I was 235 pounds in high school. And I was, when I gave birth to my daughter 13 years ago, I was never happy when I ate those things. It's like, I wanted them, but yeah. I, like you were saying the shackle, like I, I, I really did feel like chained to those foods. It's like, I wish I didn't want this, but I want it and I've got to go get it. It's like a, a drug yeah. for me. And just to have that freedom now of like, yeah, no, I don't really want that because it doesn't make me feel good. It doesn't accomplish anything Yeah, is amazing. It really is a freedom that you can't describe. Yeah. It's it, it, and it interacts with, I think, you know, one of the most toxic things about if we're going to call sugar, it sugar addiction, we'll just call it sugar addiction because I yep. well, talked about that before. And yeah. I, I think it's a bona fide phenomenon or let's, or ultra processed food addiction, whatever is that, if we consider ultra processed foods and sugar as a substance of abuse, it's one of those very rare substances of abuse that abstinence from it is more stigmatized than indulging in it because it's, it's so prevalent and underappreciated that this is a substance of abuse that um, it gets pushed on us by yep. society. And so it's not only you kind of have the drive to have that donut but it's like, everybody's telling you, you should have it and you should yeah. treat yourself. And that if you don't do it, you're depriving yourself. You're giving it to diet culture or, oh, you've lost enough weight. You're in maintenance mode. You can try it now. Or for me, it's like, why aren't you eating that donut? You're totally skinny. Like, like yeah. maybe like put on some weight. I'm like, I guess what? If I eat that donut, I'll get really sick. I'll have a flare. I'll go into the hospital. And I'll lose weight. Like there's a lot more to it than that. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's just about, it, it's, 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 it's kind of, hard and insidious because it's it's the social environment in which we live and that's really hard to get away from for basically anybody i mean i'm a pretty i don't really care what other people think kind of person and yeah. even for me it's it's hard to go out to a dinner and say no i'm fasting tonight yeah. or can i have the um you know the strip steak with like six poached eggs or the salmon with a side of like oil right like olive oil like it, it you get weird looks. Um, oh, yeah. and, and that's never easy, especially around family and in particular cultures yep. like Mexican or Indian culture. That was one thing I was talking about my friend over in Mexico before. It's like, that is the culture. And even people like patients he has, you know, they'll, they'll know TCR and ketogenic diet. They want to do it. They're good for its health, their, their health. And they're aware of that, but they're like, I'm, I'm knowingly going to take the health hit just because if, if I have to do this in my social context, I'm going to offend family. I'm going to offend friends um, and make them sad. And so, you know, in, in, in an altruistic vein, probably very genuinely, I don't think I can do this right now. And that's such a shitty thing. Yeah, it is. The thing that's blocking you from doing something good for your health is not that the diet itself is hard, but that the social constructs make it hard. And I don't have a very easy solution for that. Yeah. Other than, you know, if you really really want to put your health first if you have motivation to do that then it's your prerogative to put your health first it might mean some socially awkward interactions uh but that's kind of the conclusion i came to for myself it's like yeah i wish there was always easy solutions but when you're an adult you realize there aren't always yeah and so you know i don't know about you but now for me if like i am going out um including family events like we have my grandpa's 80th recently it's like no i'm not eating yeah. And people, then eventually people know that's your thing. They get used to it. Yeah. My, that's exactly how my family is at this point. They're like, Oh, Sarah just is going to come, but she's not going to eat anything. Like I go to birthday parties and all kinds of stuff, holidays. And it's like, I just want to be with you guys. I just want to hang out with you and enjoy the moment. It's not about the food. It's, yeah. it is, and I've had that conversation with my family several times is like, 
what's more important, the fact that I'm actually here with you to spend time with you and enjoy the moment, or yeah. is it is it like me putting this in my mouth is really going to enhance this situation more? Like, let's yeah. really talk about it. It's it's interesting because I kind of understand. I, I understand it from the other person's perspective. It's like, if, like I don't like watching movies by myself. Yeah. I like watching movies with people. There's something about having the presence of that other person in the room that's very, in, we're social organisms. It's very appealing. And say yeah. I'm watching a movie with someone, they pull out their phone during like a key point in the movie. Oh, yeah. Why should that bother me? It really bothers me. Yep. And so it's an analogous thing with food. It's like, if you're not eating and someone else is, I do understand why that's awkward for them. That said, that's their problem, quite honestly. Yeah, like, at some is. point, you have to decide, I'm not going to make it my problem because th there are only really three options here. One, I don't show up. Right. Two, I show up and I don't eat, making you feel awkward if you choose. Mm -hmm. Or three, I show up and force myself to eat something that I know is going to make me feel really unwell, potentially, to you know placate you and then get into that pattern. Um, and for some people more than others, you know, you might be vulnerable to that. For me, like I could really, really suffer. Yeah. Um, I'm not worried about gaining weight by any means, but just like the next several days, my sleep, my gut, how I feel, it could be really put off by that. And so you have to make the difficult decision and yeah. you make a decision and then people will come accustomed to it too. And if they think you're weird a little bit, hopefully your family and friends and people that matter are going to love you anyway. Yeah, exactly. They do. I mean, in my experience, they still do. And they think I'm a little bit weird but that's okay. That's fine. You know, I'm the oldest and, you know, I love my family dearly, but the oldest of three kids, I now look like the youngest, um, yeah. because we're all getting older. And at some point, like it starts to reverse and yeah, people, when we're out, they're like, Oh, you must be the youngest. I'm like, Nope. <laughs> I was, it's funny you say that I'm the oldest of three kids. And I was, um, Moving my brother who's an undergrad uh, and a, a junior at um, WashU in St. Louis, and and I was wearing I was you know um, pride for him wearing a WashU shirt, and someone mistook me for his younger brother. It's like, oh, are you what? gonna come? Like, I, like I was like finishing high school or something. I was like, no, I did my PhD. I'm going to medical school. It's like, oh, you look really young. Um, <laughs> I've always we all look young, but we'll see if that keeps up. I like that. Yeah. I feel like I've yeah. aged thirty years in the past five, to be honest, but. Maybe now I'll just like plateau. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's possible. I mean, I have a pretty stressful life out of the family. I've got a special, my 13 year old is special needs. Like she's severely autistic and non-speaking. And that is one of the big things that like catapulted me into this lifestyle was that, you know, mothers who have kids with special needs, yeah. health declines very quickly because we're hypervigilant and we're stressed out. And there's a ton of studies out there that show you have mitochondrial decline and it's like the telomeres are shortening. And so yeah. that was the big motivation for me is like, I got to be around for her and I don't want to get sick like my mom. And so it was like my mid thirties hit and it was, I was off and, you know, here I am and just reaping the benefits and feeling so good, you know, and, uh, and just grateful to have this lifestyle and just wanting, I think like you to just keep encouraging people and spreading the message that this is possible, you know, that you yeah. don't have to, to succumb to fate that you've been told you have to. Yeah. I, um, obviously I think you probably share this opinion much more important than lifespan is health span. Yes. And, uh, you know, I'm the kind of person that I like, I want to, like I said, drop dead at a hundred while running a marathon kind of deal. But the, the pictures that always impress me, like on Twitter is like the guy who's keto or carnivore, who's like, this is my 65th birthday picture. And he flashes is like, it's like, this is a six pack. Yeah. Like five. And he's like out running and doing X, Y, and Z things. It's incredible what people can do when you're, when you're healthy, like, yeah, you age, you're going to slow down a yeah. little bit, but you don't have to be the picture of what we think of as a 65 or 70 year old. Yeah. You can be out there doing the things you love basically until, you know, until the end. Yeah. Much. That's like, you want to enjoy your life while you're living it. You don't want to be chained up to machines and on a bunch of medications because mm -hmm. I feel like, yeah, we can prolong life now through these things, but what's that quality of life going to be, or you're not going to be out there probably running marathons and, and enjoying life and in participating the way that you want to. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. it's, yeah. um, 
I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm optimistic for myself. I'm optimistic for you. I'm optimistic for everybody I see in social media. And I'm optimistic for medicine, even though I think there is a general frustration that things aren't coming quick enough. Mm. I think the, the community is only growing. And from a medical perspective, there are a lot of people that are changing their perspective and say, if we want to use the word converting from a standard perspective, to this metabolic medicine, including a low carb option perspective. And importantly, no one converting the other way. Yeah. And a lot of doctors that have, you know, including in my time, having met those doctors that have at least become open-minded to ketogenic diets and low carb. And no one really like goes pro low carb and then like retro converts. Right now. It doesn't really happen. And that alone is pretty telling. Yep. Um, and it's, it's, there's so many cool conversations going on and um, I'm actually, there's a lot of doctor bashing. I don't like that. Yeah. On Twitter because, but, but in general, like I've been so optimistic talking to people who I, I go into doctor's appointments um, or, or meet with doctors that I'm always afraid I'm going to like get the rule book thrown at me or um, be shut down because I'm, you know, the, the young person in the field. And generally they come to me and they're like, this is really interesting. Like, just tell me more data. Let me know more. Um, in fact, this is kind of a funny thing. I've been to two cardiologists and my PCP um, at various time points. I'm a lean mass hyper responder. So I have a okay. really high LDL. High cholesterol, yeah. Like really high. Um, like it would cause most PCPs to have a heart attack high. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I've always thought, I've never walked out with a doctor actually telling me by the end of the appointment, you need to be on a statin. Wow. It really surprises me. Because you, you'd think, you know, if, if, if my levels are, I'll just say like, they've been the highest they've been is 565. Okay. Uh, that's LDL, not total LDL 565. And I'm not saying that's ideal, but I have particular barriers to being able to use medications like PCSK9, ZES, statins, there are a lot of options out there, or being able to adapt my lifestyle to say, include more carbs because of medical conditions I'm dealing with. And after talking to those people, you know, these pretty conventionally minded people in general, you know, they gave me their opinions and I really respect their opinions. And I want to have an ongoing discussion because I don't want to be flippant um, about this issue. I don't think it's a, a settled case, but the fact that I can walk out of there and they say, you know, if my job isn't to give you a prescription right now, mm. let's monitor this. Let's do some more tests. This is kind of interesting. I don't actually think you're at low risk, but you made some interesting points like, that for me, I, I find that really um, uplifting. Yeah. That we, we think it requires the next generation, but I don't think that, that people give a lot of, there are some that are really close-minded, but a lot of doctors enough credit for if you communicate respectfully and well with them, that they might be pretty open-minded. Yeah. And um, I don't know. There's a lot of conflict, I feel like, between the low carb community and the ketogenic diet community and then the conventional the medicine. Medical, I think that only, it only generates, well, we're going to lose that battle. Let me put it that way. If we yeah. have a low carb community, if we, if we pick that fight, it's like picking a fight with someone who's, you know, twice your size, like you will lose it. Let's not pick that fight. Let's build some allies. And that might require some concessions, but I think that's just a strategic way to go. It's kind yeah. of a, I guess you can say the game I'm playing right now, although yeah. I think quite an honest game. So We'll see yeah, how much so, of a ruckus I make at HMS. I don't know. That I mean, so that's <laughs> where it was kind of going next. Like, is that what you what you think that you're really trying to accomplish here? Is maybe bridging a little bit between the community and um, the low carb community and medical community? Is that kind of I what you're to. seeking to do? Yeah. I I think the next four years are going to be very interesting to see what opportunities I have to really interject a little bit of metabolic health into my community, the Department of Nutrition, which I'm now a part of it at Harvard. And um, there are going to be parts where I have to strategically bite my tongue. I'll be honest, I was in a a meeting the other day where they showed the my plate as part of the integrated curriculum around nutrition, and I almost bit my tongue off. Mm. Um, <laughs> that's kind of frustrating to me, yeah. but. That said, I think that my the most important people to me are my peers. And I think there is going to, there, there hopefully will be a lot of interest if there's opportunity to bring interesting people and speakers and have debates. I might be in a position to kind of organize and host those. Yeah. And I'd like to give people the opportunity to come uh, share their perspectives in, 
and we'll, we'll see where that goes. I don't think I'm going to change the community in four years, but I like to do my part and um, not make too much of a fuss in the meantime. I'm in a kind of weird position where if I make too much noise, I could get squished. Yeah. Higher on the totem pole. So next four years, I until like residency and I'm, you know, have an established career, I, I kind of have to hold back a little bit. Yeah. So to speak, just in case. Yeah. yeah. This is a long game. So I'll, I'll play my part right now. I'm, uh, I'm kind of starting a new journey. I kind of love being on the bottom of the totem pole. It's a yeah. weird thing. Yeah. I love like climbing the ladder and then starting a new ladder. Love it. The, the baby in the community. So it's uh, earn your stripes. I don't know. It's fun for me. Again, it's a journey. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm pretty excited for what I have to learn there and we'll see how my perspective changes. Cool. So you're at Harvard now and uh, you're getting on with that. So what is next for you? And I guess, where can people find you if they want to yeah. ask you questions, interact, reach out, all of that stuff? Yeah. So um, yeah, I'm about to start Harvard Med. I was um, I've been looking forward to it for several years because I deferred to do my PhD, but actually we don't start classes until August 2nd. So it's about to start for me. Um, but in the meantime, I've been doing lots of research and I have some research projects going on at, at uh, HMS with various professors there, which is really cool because there's some really awesome people like Chris Palmer and David Ludwig, some people yeah. you might know. Um, and then, you know, writing, engaging in, I, I, I love, I still love to cook. So like uh, various cookbook projects, blog writing, and um, I'm, I'm relatively active on Twitter. That's where I'm most active. So you can find me at Nick Norwitz. Um, I pop into various clubhouses. I love going on clubhouse to engage with people so you can find me there. And then I kind of have a YouTube, like you alluded to. I, I, yeah. I, it, it's basically, it's the kind of thing where if I read a really cool paper, I'll just get on, I'll describe the paper, why it's cool in like five or 10 minutes. So I think after this, I'm gonna pull up my green screen and do one on that NLRP3 and Western diet paper and uh, uh, the stem cell reprogramming just because it was interesting. That'll take me 10 minutes wow. and I'll share it. So very cool. It'll be fun, but yeah, I'm loving this and I'm loving meeting new people. So thank you for having me on because you're yeah. a plus one in my social circle. Thank you. It's been awesome to chat with you, meet with you. I know there's going to be a lot of people that are going to find tremendous value to the conversation and then follow you and continue finding more value. So thanks again for all of your time today. For sure. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah.